Hello and welcome back. So in the last few lectures, we have learned about different aspects of aluminium and aluminium alloys. We started off with pure aluminium and we had seen the different properties of pure aluminium and so on. And then we started talking about the aluminium alloys. And with regard to the alloys, we have seen different aspects such as the alloy designations. And here we talked about, you know, the aluminium association designation as to how the alloys are given a particular number to identify them in terms of their compositions. Okay. And then we have discussed about types of aluminium alloys such as rot alloys and cast alloys, okay. So rot alloys are the ones which are subjected to some secondary processing after they are cast, okay. So after they are processed, the billet which is obtained from the primary processing, it is subjected to some kind of metal forming process which will give rise to a product which is known as the rod product. So that can be, for example, a rolled sheet or an extruded rod and things like that. Okay. So these are known as the rod products or the rod alloys. Then we talked about the cast alloys as well. And we have also seen how the cast alloys are designated. Okay. And in the cast alloys, we have seen a very important alloy that is the aluminium silicon alloys. And here we have discussed about the hypoeutectic aluminium silicon alloys and the hypereutectic aluminium silicon alloys. Okay. So anything below 12.6% silicon, as you have seen, will be under the category of hypoeutectic alloys and anything beyond 12.6% silicon will be hyperutectic, okay. And here we have seen how the silicon phase grows in a particular morphology, okay, and how that can be modified to improve some of the properties such as the ductility and the toughness, okay. So we have discussed in detail the morphology and the growth of silicon and we have also seen the mechanism of modifications so that this morphology which is detrimental can be modified to a morphology which is beneficial. Okay. So all that we have discussed in uh, previous lectures and now that we have gained some understanding about aluminium and aluminium alloys, let us go ahead and see the other aspects of aluminium alloys, particularly with regard to the physical metallurgy. So from now on, whatever we are going to talk about, it will be mostly centered around the physical metallurgy of aluminium alloys. Now let us have a look at the aluminium alloys from a physical metallurgy perspective, where we will try and understand as to why these alloys are stronger. Right, because you have already seen before while we discussed about the properties of pure aluminium is the fact that the mechanical properties or the strength of pure aluminium is quite low and that is why we have the need for aluminium alloys for applications where you need higher strength, right. So therefore we need to understand as to why these alloys, you know, become stronger when you have presence of certain alloying elements, okay. And this is also kind of the start of our uh, physical metallurgy part. The physical metallurgy of aluminium alloys, okay. So we need to understand the mechanism of strengthening.
Okay, so this will be our first topic with regard to physical metallurgy of aluminium alloys. Okay, and we'll start with uh, solid solution hardening or solid solution strengthening because right now we are talking about alloys or solid solutions. So let us try and understand as to what is the mechanism of strengthening in the aluminium alloys. So I suppose when you talk about uh, strengthening, you know that we need to go back to the dislocation theory. Because anything to do with uh, deformation of metal, plastic deformation of metals, the dislocations will always come into picture because as you may know, the plastic deformation of metals occurs through a process called slip, which takes place by movement of dislocation. Right, and this movement happens on a particular plane known as slip plane, and also you have a particular slip direction. And in fact, these two put together give rise to what is called a slip system. Okay, so slip is the process which is responsible for plastic deformation of metals, right? So anything which can retard the motion of dislocations will actually increase the strength because then you need to apply more force or higher stress for the dislocations to move and therefore the strength will increase, okay? So any resistance to dislocation motion will increase the strength. So now that alloys are stronger or solute solutions are stronger compared to the pure metal, you can say that addition of this uh, solute or the alloying element hamper the motion of dislocations, right? And that is why the solute solutions or alloys are stronger. But we still do not know as to how do they do that, I mean how do they restrict the motion of dislocations and that is something that we need to understand in order to understand this mechanism, okay. So in order to understand that we need to first understand as to what happens when you add the solute atoms, the alloying elements to the parent lattice, I mean what happens to the parent lattice when some of these parent atoms are replaced by the solute atoms, okay. So here there are two scenarios, one the solute atom is bigger than the parent atom and second it is smaller than the parent atom, right. So in either case it will induce a lattice strain because the size is not matching with the size of the parent atoms. So it can either induce a compressive stress or a tensile stress. A larger uh, substitutional solute, for example, will impose a compressive stress, which you can see over here, right? Because these larger atoms will tend to push apart uh, the parent atoms and it will lead to, you know, some kind of expansion in the lattice, but these atoms will tend to pull back 
to come back to their original equilibrium positions and as a result of that you can expect that it will experience a compressive force because these atoms are trying to pull it back themselves so that they can reach their original equilibrium positions right as these bigger atoms tend to displace them right on the other hand uh, in this case the scenario is completely opposite here the solute atom is smaller than the parent atom so here it will cause some kind of uh, compression here along the lattice but again the atoms will tend to pull back to their original position and as a result of that it will cause tensile stresses on the lattice as a whole okay so in one case when it is bigger it is subjected to the lattice is subjected to a compressive stress and when the solute atoms are smaller the parent lattice will be subjected to tensile stresses okay so for bigger it is compressive and for smaller atoms smaller solute atoms it is tensile okay so as i said in either case it is going to cause some kind of lattice strain and this is what is responsible for the impediment to the dislocation motion okay so what happens as to why this kind of stress field will restrict the dislocation motion if you want to understand that you will have to look at the dislocation and you know the stress field around it the dislocation also has a stress field around it because uh, this is a kind of distorted portion of the lattice so presence of dislocations also introduces some kind of strain on the lattice so across the dislocation if you see over and below it above it is compression and below there is a tension okay so here is a stress field the one part of which is tension that is below the half plane and above it it is a compressive stress field right so now depending on the size of the solute atoms that means whether they are smaller or bigger or whether they are under compressive or tensile stress you know this stress field of the dislocation core will attract them right the solid atoms with the tensile strain field will diffuse to the dislocation core to nullify the compressive strain field of the dislocation right so that means the smaller atoms which cause tensile stresses to the lattice will be attracted by the compressive stress field of the dislocation and the bigger ones which cause compressive stress will be attracted to the tensile stress field of the dislocation core right so when the solute atoms diffuse to the core of the dislocation the motion of the dislocations will be hampered okay and that is how the strength will increase as the dislocations will find it difficult to move when the solute atoms diffuse to the dislocation core and try to pin them down okay so the result you can see over here in terms of the strength so this is a stress strain diagram for three materials one of them is the pure metal and other two are two alloys having a particular composition so as you increase the concentration of the alloying element or the concentration of the solute you can see the strength also increases because it will cause more and more impediment to the dislocation motion and as a result the strength will increase as you increase the concentration of the alloying element okay so that's what you see over here right so this entire phenomena is therefore known as solute solution hardening or solute solution strengthening okay but we still need to understand as to what exactly happens when the solute atoms diffuse to the dislocation core i mean you need to understand what kind of interactions will take place 
between the solid atoms and the dislocations okay which will ultimately lead to the impediment to the dislocation motion okay so let us try and understand that so that's the second part of this uh, particular mechanism as to how the solid solution strengthening takes place one of course is this kind of uh, you know interaction the attraction between the compressive stress field and the tensile stress field that the solute atoms induce or the tensile stress field of the dislocation and the compressive field of the solute atoms so this is attraction between tension and compression that's what leads to the restriction to the motion but what exactly happens that also we need to understand as i said okay so that's the second part of it so let us discuss that and try and understand the interactions so this part will give you little more understanding you know as to what is going to happen when you have the presence of these uh, solute atoms and when the material is being loaded so first part is of course you know it's the elastic interaction what we have already discussed right that means the opposite forces attracting each other compressive field of the dislocation attracting the tensile field of the solute and vice versa so this is one thing that is definitely going to happen because as i said the solute atoms will introduce some kind of strain field into the lattice and this basically arises due to the atomic size difference that we already talked about right do you know the hume rothery rules and you know there is a certain amount of uh, difference in the size up to a maximum 15% of difference can be accommodated as per the hume rothery rules we all know that right so due to that size difference it introduces some kind of strain into the lattice and that restricts the motion of the dislocations and that is what just now we have discussed okay right so elastic interaction is all about the interaction between the solute atoms and the dislocation due to the difference in the atomic size okay so this is one of the mechanisms by which the solute atoms and the dislocations interact the second mechanism is the modulus interaction this arises uh, due to the fact that the elastic modulus of the parent metal and the alloying element is different and due to that when the solute atoms are added to the parent metal the modulus will change locally right and this will also lead to an attraction between the atoms the solute atoms and the dislocation especially when the shear modulus decreases the dislocations will tend to attach to these regions where the modulus particularly the shear modulus decreases 
and that is how you know this attraction that means the this location is going towards this kind of regions where the modulus decreases will lead to the restriction of the motion of the dislocations and that is how the strength is going to increase okay modulus interaction is uh, similar to elastic interaction but one thing that uh, you should remember here is the fact that for elastic interaction the substitutional solute atoms can interact only with edge dislocations so as you know there are two kinds of uh, dislocations edge and screw the strain field associated with uh, substitutional solute atoms is more symmetrical you can say it is kind of uh, spherical in shape and therefore the solute atoms of this nature that is the substitutional solute atoms will interact only with edge dislocations because in case of screw dislocations the strain field is almost uh, pure shear and the strain field associated with the substitutional solute being spherical will not be able to interact with such strain fields associated with the screw dislocations the interstitial solute atoms on the other hand can interact with both edge as well as screw dislocations because the strain field associated with the interstitial atoms has both shear and dilatation components right so interstitial solutes can interact with both edge as well as screw dislocations and modulus interaction can also occur for both edge and screw dislocation right so as i said modulus interaction is similar to elastic interaction and this can happen for both type of dislocations the next one is known as stacking fault interaction this happens when the dislocations split into partials because uh, sometimes the movement of dislocations uh, can happen in different uh, manner and due to that you know one dislocation having a particular burger vector let's say b1 can dissociate into two partial dislocations with burger vector b2 and b3 okay so this kind of uh, dissociation of a dislocation into two partials leads to a stacking fault in this gap i suppose you all know what a stacking fault is this is again a crystal defect which arises if there is a disturbance or distortion in the stacking sequence of the planes okay for example in hcc lattice we know the sequence is abc abc right so if this abc sequence somehow is disturbed then uh, that will give rise to a defect or a fault known as stacking fault right now the solid atoms which are added might have some 
preferential solubility to this uh, stacking fault region because the structure of the stacking fault region is different from the parent metal okay so if you talk about an um, fcc lattice while the parent metal is fcc the stacking fault will become abab because you know because of this stacking fault which will remove let's say this c layer so it might become abab and abab stacking is nothing but a hexagonal closed packed structure a hcp structure right so while the lattice is fcc this is hcp and therefore the solubility of the solute atoms is quite different in the stacking fault than what you have in the parent metal right so therefore the solute atoms might preferentially segregate along this uh, stacking fault and therefore the constriction of these two partials into a single dislocation again will be difficult due to the presence of this uh, solute atoms along this gap okay so this dislocation can only move again when you reduce this uh, width which is known as the stacking fault width okay you have to make it really narrow so that it again kind of becomes a single dislocation then only this can move okay larger this uh, width it will be more difficult to move the dislocations right and that is what happens when these uh, solid atoms are preferentially segregated along the stacking fault uh, this weight will be maintained it is not going to decrease and as a result of that the dislocations will find it difficult to move right so this is uh, one of the mechanisms by which the solid atoms can restrict the movement of dislocations by getting segregated along this stacking fault which is present in the gap between the partials like you have elastic interaction and uh, the attraction between opposite uh, stress field you can also have electrical interaction where where there can be attraction between oppositely charged uh, species electrical species okay because like how you have stress field in the dislocation core you also have a dipole in the dislocation core so this dipole will have a positive and negative end and therefore the positive band will attract the negative portion of the lattice that is resulted due to the presence of the solid atoms and the positive part on the other hand similarly will attract the negative portion of the lattice due to the presence of uh, solute atoms right so that is what is uh, known as uh, electrical interaction because uh, you also know that solute atoms apart from size difference there is one more difference solute atoms have a different valency so while the elastic interaction arises due to the size difference here the electrical interactions arise due to the valency difference because due to the difference in the valency the charge will be concentrated around the solute atoms and that is how it will give rise to positive and negative ends and that will be attracted by the dipole which is present in the dislocation core right as i said the positive charge will be attracted to the negative end of this and vice versa and that is how the solid atoms will again get attracted to the dislocation core and will restrict their movement right so with that we come to the end of uh, this particular lecture and the rest of the things that we have on this topic will be taken up in the next lecture so i'm going to stop here today thank you for your attention